The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. One of the most incredible moments of my entire ministry happened as I was preparing to administer last rites to a woman dying of cancer. Her name was Lottie. A woman of great generosity, she had faced each, each step on the way to her impending death with grace. She fought hard and valiantly, and it had been a long struggle. Now her breathing was labored, ragged. She was beyond words. I'm not even sure she knew that we were there. Her family had gathered at her bedside. And just as we began to say the prayers, her grown daughter climbed into the bed with Lottie and cradled her mother in her arms. Today's gospel feels like that kind of moment. The air was dense with death in Bethany. Lazarus, fresh from the grave, is at table with the others. And out in the yard, a recently vacated tomb, smelling still of burial spices, awaiting a new occupant. And while there might have been some doubt about whose death was coming, Mary's prophetic act reveals the truth. Without a word, she kneels at Jesus' feet and washes them. The smell of the precious oil fills the entire house, a sharp scent somewhere between mint and ginseng. And in a moment, all the oil is gone. The pound of pure nard, an expensive perfume valued at 300 denarii, enough to feed a family for a year, enough to pay a year's wages. It is an act so lavish, so extravagant. The meaning is clear in death as in life. Here is the extravagance of God's love made flesh. Here is the excessiveness of God's mercy made manifest. I invite you to step as deeply and as fully as you are able into each moment as we approach the last week of Jesus' life. Had he stayed away from Jerusalem, he might have survived. But he has returned to its suburb, Bethany, where he raised Lazarus from the dead, a miracle that was, for the religious authorities, the final straw. He has angered them at every turn, chatting with the Samaritan woman, healing the blind on the Sabbath, eating with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes. In returning to Bethany, he has signed his own death warrant. Jesus knows it. His friends know it. But like Mary's lavish gift, Jesus is ready to spend all he has and all for love of us. When Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time, 
Like the crowds, we will wave palm branches on Palm Sunday, shout out our hosannas. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On Monday and Tuesday, in what we now know as Holy Week, we will hold evening prayer. During those services, everyone who wishes to will be invited to come forward and receive anointing of their hands as a sign of our common ministries through our baptisms. As a reminder that we have this incredible ministry of reconciliation in the name of Jesus Christ. As a reminder that we are here to help heal a broken and hurting world. Wednesday in Holy Week will include Tenebrae, a service of light and darkness, of sound and silence. As we recall the stories of our faith, we will extinguish candles until only one remains. Imagine that these candles represent something you value, a possession, a relationship, an achievement, maybe even your health. Each candle extinguished represents the temporary nature of these things we value and hold and withhold so closely. Relationships end, our loved ones die, our possessions are lost, our health fails until only one candle remains, the Christ candle. What remains is the light and love of Christ, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. On Maundy Thursday, at Jesus' instruction, there is the final meal of bread and wine. And in a show of humility and our own servanthood, modeled after Jesus, we wash one another's feet as Jesus did that Last Supper. The altar stripped, another reminder of the falling away of our pretenses. The altar washed with the same reverence and solemnity as Mary's use of the oil today, as though preparing a body for burial. We leave in silence and darkness. Jesus' request of the disciples ringing in our own ears in the Garden of Gethsemane. Stay awake and pray with me. Can you keep watch just one hour? The morn arrives on Friday, and we gather for one of the holiest days of our entire Christian calendar, using movement, memory, and imagination. We are on the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, stopping and starting, falling and rising amid the jeers and insults of the crowds, on the road to Calvary with Jesus. A priest I know in Maryland is walking a different kind of Stations of the Cross this year. He and others are walking the city of Baltimore's seven miles of streets, pausing to pray at each of the places where someone was killed in gun violence this past year all of them young, all of them under 30 years old, all of them African-American, all except one male, all shot dead. As he walks, he tells me, he will be joined by others facing what they call the unholy trinity of violence, racism, poverty, and guns, facing the cracks in the sidewalks, the trash on the streets, the boarded up and vacant buildings, carrying as a cross despair, hopelessness, what happens when dreams die. And finally, on Good Friday, we will carry the cross into the sanctuary and lay it here before the altar. Our solemn liturgy that follows recalls God's relentless grace in the midst of the entirety of our lives. The cross confronts us with the expansiveness of Jesus, with the expense of squandering his life and all for love of us. 
clearing away pretense, avoidance, denial. We face squarely the brokenness of our lives, of our relationships, of our community, and of our world, admitting we cannot make this walk alone, accepting our need for a savior, acknowledging those things we need to leave here at the cross with him in order to be healthy and whole. Whatever separates us from the love of God, with nails blessed, we pound those things into the hard wood of the cross. Shame, guilt, fear, anger, hatred, jealousy, and we leave it all right here. With the great vigil of Easter, we light the new fire Saturday night. We illuminate the Paschal candle. We recall the ancient stories of prophecy and salvation, the stories of God's people, our story. We make again our baptismal promises. This is the first service of Easter. It is also the oldest Christian service. Come Sunday morning, we celebrate the victory of Christ over death, the day of resurrection. There will be Easter eggs and bring bells, <laughs> bring bells to ring both Saturday and Sunday, to ring out as we say the words we have yearned to say for so long. Through this journey we make yet again, I invite you to remember this image of Mary pouring out the precious oil, a year's wages worth, a year's meals worth, her tears spilling over in an act of extreme extravagance, a gesture of deepest love. So lavish an act, it telegraphs to us the extravagance and lavishness of God's love for us. And hear the invitation of God to God's own people, an invitation to newness and fullness and foreverness of life. Today's story invites us to love God, to love one another as we are already loved, intimately, extravagantly. Mary's prophetic act today tells us that though we face Good Friday yet, Easter always follows. It tells us that what is broken, blessed, and given for others is never lost. That not one ounce of this expensive nard, any more than Jesus' own life and precious love, will be held back or reserved, kept on a shelf and admired. This precious substance will not be saved. It will be opened offered and used at great price. It will be raised up and poured out for all humankind, emptied to the last drop. The walk from here to Calvary is not an easy path. It is lined with tears and broken hearts disappointments and fears. It may feel something like awaiting a death, but that is no reason to lock up our hearts or to hide away. Rather, it is an invitation to walk it together, unafraid, with hearts open and yearning, ears straining, eyes piercing the shadows for the first glimpse of our risen Savior. Enter as much and as deeply into as much and as deeply as you can bear to stand it. Because God's own self awaits us. God's lavish love will cradle us. God is ready to spend all and much, much more than we can ever ask or imagine. And all for the love of us. Unending gifts from our lavish, Lavish Lord. Amen.